class that uh, I taught for the last six weeks at Stagebridge with these great storytellers, performers. Uh, thank you for being here. We've got some great stories and we're going to kick it off. Uh, first, let me just say that all of this was part of a meditative process where we try to get the stories out of us and then put them on the page and then get it into our bodies and our feelings and then to tell the story to tell the story. So they're five minute stories or so. They're great stories about uh, personal lives. Uh, I use some of the techniques I learned as a journalist, as a reporter uh, of telling stories, thousands of stories throughout my career. But now I'm telling more personal stories. And that married with the meditative kinds of techniques I've used uh, helped me teach this class. And I hope that you'll enjoy the stories that we hear from. Uh, I, all these great students, one of whom is in the Netherlands now. And so this is an international public performance. So you're part of a very special thing here at Stagebridge. So now let me introduce the first performer. He is from South Africa and he has an interesting story about being punctual. And that is why we are starting at 11 10 instead of 11 o'clock but it's a good story that he developed in class here is john richardson and if you can unmute john there you go hey there we are so good morning thanks for attending so as a child i hated being late if I had an appointment, I became uneasy long before the time. And if there was a chance we could be delayed, I become nervous and start fidgeting. And if a third person was involved, we were waiting for someone, I'd be glancing at the watch and the clock and then lapse into, where are they? Do you think they've forgotten? Something must have happened. This behavior was especially extreme when my mother was involved. She was chronically late. It upset me terribly. If I was driving with her to any event, all I could think about was what people would think when we, that is I, arrived late. My mother wasn't a shrinking violet. She would sail in, announce her, and perforce my late arrival with a loud greeting, a throwaway remark about the traffic or car keys, and was into the party. She was social, outgoing, fun-loving, empathetic. The one thing she was not, was punctual. The facade of punctuality, yes. At home, punctuality took concrete form in a voluminous calendar next to the telephone. It recorded all social events, appointments, school functions, the map of our lives in dates and times. And the times were all there and all right, all entered correctly. My mother just found it impossible to follow them. As a punctilious accountant in 1960s South Africa, my father was a paragon of punctuality. And my mother approved in principle, especially if she was expecting guests. But if they were late, well, dinner would wait. She also approved if she was a guest. There, her approval was just a principle. It didn't affect her behavior. Arriving was important. When? Less so. Occasionally, I'd accompany my mother to dinner with friends, which always started off with me tense about when we were going, had to arrive, and when we would then leave the house. During one of my father's absences, old family friends, Kathy and Matt, invited my mother and me to dinner. I'd known them since childhood and sometimes would be parked with them when my parents were away. 6.30 was early for dinner, but it was a school night and the lift club would be there at 7.40 the next morning. Strange though, to imagine my mother being anywhere at 6.30 in the evening. This would not start well. However, it would have been much worse if with anyone else. I showered and dressed and brushed my hair as carefully as any 16 year old, studied my appearance in the mirror, and at 
went to the living room to wait for my mother. She was waiting for me. I stared at her. Oh, my mother laughed, just the reaction she'd hoped for. We set off in a jaunty mood along my elementary school route as it happened. My mother drove fast as usual. Perhaps it was a consequence of her being always late, but it had become habitual. On this road, I often had a school lift club flashback. Years earlier, when, I was, when it was my mother's turn to take the lift club, we would always be late leaving the house. And by the time we picked up the other kids, we'd be urging her to drive faster. Finally, she'd, say, she'd turn and say, well, you know that if we get caught, you pay the fine. And she would accelerate down the expressway. Or the kids, we'd sit up in delight and we'd know we had to watch out. And six pairs of eyes could pick, up, pick out any cop car 30, 300 yards away. This evening, she was going to surprise Mac, who, was, who always welcomed her with an amiable but unnecessary remark about, about punctuality. We pressed the apartment doorbell at 6.30 sharp. Silence. I looked at my mother and she signaled me to press again. Silence. Then the peephole cover shifted. Mac was in his bathrobe and he was surprised. Kathy will be out shortly. My mother smiled knowingly. Knowledge confirmed when Mac returned dressed and laughing. We didn't expect you much before 7.30. He excused himself to get ice and water. My mother looked at me and narrowed her eyes and lips and still smiling, never again. And she wasn't. <laughs> Okay, that's it. Thank you. Th thank, thank, thank you, thank you, John. Oh, oh, oh! You caught me. You got, you got me. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm, I'm not in my bathroom anymore. No, that was a great story that you. I saw it evolve. Thank you for sharing, John, and your punctuality. And now John has got another occasion, so he may have he may be maybe leaving yeah, during the performance. Well, half an hour. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Our next performer, this truly, John was in South Africa with his story. Our next performer is in the Netherlands. So live, we're live from the Netherlands at Stagebridge. This is an international public performance. Mel uh, is, he's on the board. Mel Terry's on the board of Stagebridge. So he must give a great story now, I think. No, no, no pressure. No pressure. Here he is. In, in the Netherlands, military. Thank, thank you, Emil, I think. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, my story starts with a glass of wine at a very fancy fundraiser in San Francisco at the Mark Hopkins Hotel in 2018. After the first glass of wine, I'm feeling a little rosy. Second glass of wine, I convinced my husband, Herod, we have to bid on this trip. Third glass of wine, the bidding war is on, and we emerge victorious. The prize, a one-week all-inclusive trip to Zulu Nayala, a resort in the middle of a nature preserve in South Africa. Oh my god, we're going to South Africa! Well, on the flight over to Amsterdam, we happened to sit next to, coincidentally, the military attache from the US to South Africa, who was living in Johannesburg. So we pumped in for questions and um, with a lot of questions on the way over. And he tells us, well, you can have a good time in South Africa. If you see logs across the road, don't stop. That's a setup for robbery. Oh. If somebody says, follow me, don't. That's a setup for robbery. If you do get robbed, give them what they ask for. Robberies go deadly very quick in South Africa 
if you struggle. We look at each other. Well, now we know what to do. So on our first day, we're driving our white, our RAV4, for the first time on the left side of the road. We stopped to get gas and boom, oh, I hit the, uh, the bumper of the, uh, the island of the, the, the gas pump. Okay, uh, well, lesson learned. Um, we drive on and my backseat driver is like, look out for the monkeys on the side of the road. Watch those people over there crossing. You're going too far to the left. Watch a giant pothole over there. Well, despite all the obstacles, we make it to Zula Neala in one piece. And our accommodations there are palatial. Uh, we have this wonderful buffet piled high with all kinds of food. I can still smell the warthog bacon and the crocodile stew. Every morning, it's winter, we roll out of bed at 5 a.m., hop into our open Jeep, and head off to hunt the big five. And we encounter them, and then we shoot them with our cameras. Our, our guide, Brett, with his bushy blonde hair and his uh, lush accent, he tells us to put our phones on flat mode. Flat mode? Oh, flight mode. Oh, like on the airplane. So that the poachers can't geolocate the rhinos. Wow. Well, after our wonderful stay at Zulayala, we drive to Pretoria and Johannesburg. And everywhere you see these huge billboards. Crime hotspot. Get off your phones. Pay attention. Well, after our discussion with the uh, attache, it made us a little queasy. But in fact, nothing really bad happened while we were there. So we fly off to Cape Town. And in Cape Town, there aren't any billboards around saying crime hotspots. So we feel more comfortable. We drive around the scenery there is awesome. And of course, we fall in love with the penguins. And um, we're having a great time. On our very last day, my husband, Herrick, suggests that we go to some area where it's less touristy, see how, how the locals live. So we drive there, we park our car, and then, hey, where are the parking meters? Uh, are you over there in the orange vest? Um, how do we pay for parking? Well, um, you find somebody with an orange vest, but not me. I'm not on your block. The person you want is over there. So we trot off to find our guy. And very soon, a tall, well-dressed man um, with a big smile, he comes up and he says, um, oh, you don't have to pay, find somebody to pay for parking. You just go to the kiosk over there and use your card and you can get a, a parking permit. Uh, just follow me, follow me. Hmm, where have I heard that before? So after a moment, we trot up to this guy and um, I'm feeling a little uneasy, but I'm caught up in the momentum. And, uh, you know, Herod says to me uh, in Dutch is, folk ni so fear, uh, don't follow so far. Uh, what does that mean? Um, so I just keep following this guy. And then, uh-oh, we find ourselves in this dimly lit ATM alcove. And I kind of wake up from my trance and this isn't a kiosk or parking lot. This is an ATM. Oh, no, no, this is not an ATM. This is a, a kiosk. Just put your credit card into the machine and you'll get a parking ticket. Out of the corner of my eye, I spy somebody. I think this is an accomplice. Oh, my God, we're going to be robbed. My heart starts beating really fast. It goes up from my chest into my throat. My legs turn to rubber. And then, whoosh. Four uniformed police show up with a civilian trailing behind. Those guys running off there. They're trying to rob these men. Oh my God, thank you. You saved us. Lesson learned. Now let's go have a glass of wine. Thank you. 
Very nice, Mel. S soon to be an episode of CSI Cape Town, I'm sure. But uh, a warning, a warning if you travel. Uh, thank you for sharing that story. And thank you for tuning in from the Netherlands and making our performance, our public performance here, it truly international. Our next student is um, a woman who is a, she's a, a, a like a lot of our storytellers, uh, she's member a member of storytelling club. Uh, I want to introduce Marion Ferrante. I keep thinking I know a guy named who's. You know, for the last five weeks, I've had to be thinking of Marion, and now Marion. I hope we see each other again in the subsequent class. But because uh, I know a guy whose last name is Ferrante, and now he will replace you. But hopefully you'll be in the, in my mind. For, oh, well, Marion Ferrante, storyteller. Here's her story. Thank you, Emil. March 31st, 2012. I drove with my niece, Kimberly out to Lagoon Valley Park at Vacaville, California. We were greeted by gray, cloudy skies. They were overlooking these green, grassy hills surrounding the lake there. I saw some fishermen and I saw some children playing over the, by, the, by the bathrooms. They were playing and chasing each other. Overhead was a red-shouldered hawk. Oh, I love being out here to see the nature, to see the animals in their habitats. We lined up because we were there today for a 5K run. We had registered in our age brackets and we lined up when the, the, uh, the 10K went ahead of us and then it was the 5K runners. So we lined up and the shotgun went off for the start. But you would think that shotgun was for the skies because just as it went off, the skies opened up. Oh my gosh, it's starting to rain, but we forged on. Well, the, the run went right by the parking lot. So we diverted over to the car. Time lost, yes, but I knew I'd be, oh, I'd be much more comfortable if I was dry. So we got on our rain ponchos. Getting back to the run, the main group already went ahead of us and they were around the bend. We had to follow the trail markers. 5K runners to the right, 10K runners on up the hills. We followed those 5K markers during the morning. Well, I guess we must have lost the trail marker because by mid morning, we were still high up on the hills. We weren't down close enough to the ending, so we looked for more from, for trail markers. Caw, caw, oh, Mr. Crow, can you help us? That way, I said, and off we went, and it went. More downward on the hills, that made me feel better, and then we saw some 5K markers. Well, by then, you know, it'd been raining and sprinkling all that time. The trails were wet. The trails got muddy and we slipped and slid on down the hill to cross the finish line. Well, we've crossed, we were still proud even though we were last, but I'm in the seniors and I got second place. Oops. We have talked about that day and we always laugh. We say we went on the Lagoon Valley mud run that day. August 4th, 2021, I drove back out to Lagoon Valley Park with my niece, Kimberly. We were out there this time for a morning walk. Thought we'd put in a couple hours out in the outdoors, but we got there. The clouds, well, it wasn't clouds. The skies were gray, but it was smoke. And the heat of the day already at 10 a.m. was so hot that we didn't go up those hills. 
and we cut our time back to one hour. It's going to be too hot out here and smoky to stay. We looked around and this time we're greeted by dry grassy hills and a dry, a bone dry lake bed out there. As we walked around, our hiking shoes just crunched, dry, dry, weeds everywhere, dry mud, no grass. We walked between the area of the parking lot and the lake. Walking alongside there, pretty soon a Toyota, an old Toyota truck drove up and the guy called out, hey, what happened? I came here to go fishing. I told him, well, there ain't no fish out here today. No, there certainly weren't. I wonder how long it's been since he's been out here. Obviously a while. Where's he been in the world? There is climate change and it's definitely different out here today. We walked along the lake edge and then we decided we're gonna walk straight across that bone dry lake bed. At first we parted dry tules and parted them. Some of them were waist high, but they were dead now. And we walked out toward the middle of that lake bed. Then reaching the open mud, well, dry mud, it was like walking on puzzle pieces everywhere. We had to watch out to not to twist our ankle in the, in the mud cracks out there. We proceeded, we we're going, we decided to go straight across that middle of that dry lake bit. As we went out there, I saw a rock. It was kind of a big rock, but getting over to see it, like that is not a rock. Oh no, Kimberly, it's a turtle, a turtle that poor thing, and it was pretty good size. Oh, its head and neck were shriveled and dry and flat and protruding out. Oh no, this is awful. That turtle, it just hit me in the heart like, what's good? What else? How many more turtles died out here? I don't know if anybody tried to save them. I don't know. I only know that I'm here today. Well, we finished our walk across the lake, went around back to our car, went back home. We went over to my nieces to spend some more time and had a good visit. But as I drove home, I kept thinking about that turtle. Is there something I can do? Are there any more turtles out there? Is there anything alive out there? Well, it certainly didn't look like it today. I went online. I found there's a California turtle and tortoise club. This is it. You know, I love turtles. When I was little, I would buy 25 cents little tiny red ear turtles, slider turtles from the California State Fair, 25 cents. And I have a turtle collection. My favorite is the one with the mosaic tile on its back. I, I need a point at a turtle. It's on my wall. I love turtles. Is there more I can do? But you know, with this California turtle and tortoise club, there's something that I can do. I can donate to them. But beyond that, it's still on my heart. Did anybody ever go out there and try and rescue the turtles? Did they try and rescue the fish? I can think of all the habitat that's been out there. Are the birds still okay? I don't know, I, I don't know. But I do know there's sometimes some steps that I can take. And that day I knew that turtle lives mattered too. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. A little, we, we have uh, green and international with Mel and we have conservation and the animals with your story and climate change. Thank you very much for sharing that, Marion. 
Our uh, next teller is uh, she's from Baltimore, I found out. And uh, uh, our next teller uh, talks about coming cross country uh, to California and something happened to her along the way. Our next teller is Mary Claire McCauley. Thank you. So when I was a kid, I kind of used to, you know, try to put on this tough act, but I was kind of a wimp. You know, I remember in middle school, some of the tougher kids would like offer me out and I'd accept. And then when it came to it, I'd be like, Ugh. and I just try to make friends with them because I couldn't even land a punch. I just wasn't good at it. So now why was I having these harrowing fantasies, these violent fantasies of gouging this guy's eyes out? You know, I wanted to jump up and down on his body with my stiletto heels. I, I, I wanted to tie his balls in a bow, double knotted. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so when I was, I guess I was in my early 20s, I had just finished my second year of college and I was having a lousy summer. My first and only true love, uh, we broke up, and I wasn't looking forward to my third year of college. I, I, I needed a break. I needed an adventure. I needed to get out of Baltimore. So I did. I took off out west, go west. And eventually I found this really cool job at a resort right near the East Gate entrance to Yellowstone Park. And I had the time of my life. So much that I wanted to experience winter in Wyoming. So I got this other job at this dream ranch. I mean, it was like the gift of all gifts. 50 head of horses, emus, birds, pygmy goats. It was amazing. But was, what was really what was amazing was meeting Lewis. Lewis. He was over six feet tall, black hair pulled back, dark eyes, flannel shirt, cowboy boots. He was gorgeous. And not only that, he was part Sioux Indian and full blood cowboy. So I was getting both fantasies in one guy. Shazam. Well, we fall in love. We are having this great time. He's, he works at the ranch too. And then eventually after almost, I don't know, five or six months, we decide to leave and go live on top of a mountain together. First to get there, we have to drive his truck, then we drive the Jeep, and then a snowmobile. I mean, we are up there with the elk, and he is really a great rider, dancer, photographer. He's so talented. We were just having so much fun until we're not. At first, Lewis doesn't come home till late in the day and drunk. And he's deceiving me. And then it's weird, like his friends stare at me and I find out later he's married. He's only a couple years older than me. He's married and has a kid. So when I confront him with this, he starts getting violent. Turns out he was doing cocaine too. Didn't even share, didn't even tell me. I would have done some cocaine at the time. So he, he so when I confront him with this, he starts getting violent. It turns bad, it turns ugly. It turns into really literally the shining. He puts a gun to my head, he rapes me. So I literally had to escape. I had to get out and with some planning and with some friends from Baltimore, I do, and actually some sheer luck. I go back to Baltimore, my family takes care of me, my therapist glues me back together and I start feeling good except for these fantasies that won't stop, these dark, violent fantasies. I wanna get him back for what he did to me. Well, about a year goes by and I meet this other guy, completely different, Bill. He's from, he's from Virginia. He's an artist, an Irish guy. And he, he's funny, he has this funny voice, kind of talks like this. <laughs> well, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's just kind of fun to do. You know what I mean? Am I wrong or am I right? <laughs> That's Bill. So Bill and I decide we're gonna go, <laughs> we're gonna go to California and he's gonna be a scenic artist and I'm gonna finish college. So on the way to California, we decide, well, I kind of ask him if this could happen, if we could stop at the resort that I worked at at, East, at the East Gate entrance to Yellowstone 
and and work there for the summer and Bill's all for it. Yeah, he wants that 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 experience and the people at the resort love me. They take me back and Bill and I are working there and I'm thinking that I'm going to run into Lewis because see, there's a lot of dude ranches on all the all the entrances to Yellowstone and the cowboys kind of make their rounds around, you know, to, to these dude ranches where there's all these young girls from the West, from the East who want this cowboy experience. Lewis had done it a lot, he had told me before we met. So I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna meet him and I'm gonna get to act out some of these fantasies, you know, <laughs> this, is big, this is a big deal. Well, summer's almost over and I still haven't seen him. And everybody at the ranch knows Lewis and they know what he has done for, to me. So they're kind of on the lookout too. Well, anyway, it was about a week before we were gonna leave Bill and I to get back, to get to California. And we're gonna to go to one of these lodges down the road for dinner to celebrate. So I'm getting ready. I, I said, look, just go to the bar. I'll meet you at the bar after I get dressed. So I walk into the bar and I'm facing it. And there is Bill sitting next to Lewis. They're both friendly guys and they don't know each other. And they're talking and they're having a great time. Now, Tina, the bartender, she's like looking at me like, and then flanked next to her is John, this guy with his big five gallon cowboy hat. And to the other side, her, to her other side is, is Charlie. Charlie's like this brawny guy with these really intense green eyes. And they're looking at me like, whatever you want, Mary Claire, we're here for you. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I am shaking. I am really shaking. So I walk, I, I don't know what comes over me, but I walk straight up between the both of them. And first I just look at Lewis, I go, hi, how you doing? And then I look at Bill and I say, we gotta go, a reservation, let's go. We gotta go now. And Bill's like, what are you, when we're just, I'm like, please Bill, let's go now. And I get up and I, and I get out and I walk out the door and Bill's like coming after me, what's wrong with you? We were having a good conversation. You wanna like that guy. I'm like, let's go, please. And I get in the car and I'm just like, I'm shaking. And Bill's like, come on, hon. I'm like, please, we're late. Let's just go. I don't say a word. We're driving down the road. And then finally, we're just about at the, at the lodge. And I go, that was Lewis. You were talking to Lewis. And he's like, Aah! with the brakes. I'm like, just keep going. We pull into the lodge. He parks, but he doesn't turn off the ignition. And I'm like, oh my God, that was him. That was him, Bill. I can't believe it. My moment is finally here. Jeez, what did I do? And he's like, well, should we go back? You want to go back? Oh, I don't know. I had so many things I wanted to say, so many things I wanted to do. Bill's just looking at me. I just, I fall apart. No, no, I don't want to go back. Let's just, let's just go, let's just go eat. Let's just go have a drink. Well, meanwhile, meanwhile, back at the ranch, Charlie and John and Tina told, told Lewis to never come back, to get out and leave, which he did. Well, a few weeks later, I realized, you know, well, first of all, the fantasies had kind of stopped. I was a little annoyed that I didn't, that I didn't like do something, but I, I felt kind of like a relief, like Grace had, Grace had come upon me. Grace, I was touched with Grace at the moment. I made the right choice. And I was glad about that. Nothing good would have come of it. I probably couldn't have thrown a punch anyway. And he definitely wasn't worthy of a bow. Grace Hurry, thank you very much for sharing wow. that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a funny thing happened on the way from Baltimore and the rest is history. Now you're in California. Thanks again, Mary Claire. Our, our next storyteller is uh, someone I've known pretty much all my life. He, he's a God brother. Uh, his mother was sort of my guardian angel for so many years. And uh, he's here. He's a storyteller. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Julian Simeon. Thank you, Emil. Don't move, huh? This is sharp. I might cut off your ear. 
even as a little kid, I knew he was serious. I only did not move. I did not breathe. Not until uncle was done cutting the hair around my ears. <laughs> it might have been my first haircut. It was 1958. I was five years old. We lived at 112 Gage Street, just below Bernal Heights in San Francisco. Uncle would never intentionally harm me. No, never. And he was a good barber, I think. I mean, he had an electric hair cutter, the sharp scissors, the talcum powder, even the gown that snapped snug around the neck. So as I obediently sat on two thick telephone books stacked on top of our yellow metal step stool slash high chair, I got my hair cut and listened to my dad and uncle converse in their native Ilocano. Though I had no idea what they were talking about, I like to think that sometimes they told stories of their early lives in America. Stories I'll never really know. My uncle, Victor A. Simeon, born 1898, immigra immigrated to America from Hirona Tarlac, Philippines, 1921. He was my dad's older brother, the third eldest of 13 siblings. Uncle was the first Simeon to emigrate from the Philippines. He was the backbone of the clan here in America. I wish I knew more about his earlier life. All that's left me are black and white photographs and my memories of the stories attached to those photographs. And of course, what my child self saw, heard, and remembers. I remember my uncle coming to our house every day after work. He retired as a civilian electrician working at Hunters Point Naval Shipyard. When I see him walking up the street, uncle's here, I'd yell with glee, running to him. He'd pick me up, smell, and kiss me on top of my head. Mom would disapprove of me, comment, Ay, his head is my bajo, stinky. <laughs> Not to me, smells perfume. And he'd laugh. Uncle was a widower. He met and married his wife, Katrina, in San Francisco during the 1930s. He was one of the lucky ones. During that time, Filipino men outnumbered Filipino women. 14 to one. I'm certain they had plans for a big family, but that was not to be. Twin boys died in childbirth. Those deaths occurred years before I was born. Uncle never remarried, and I never once heard him speak of them. But every Saturday, dad would drive him to the Holy Cross Cemetery in Colma, and uncle would place fresh cut flowers on Katrina's grave every Saturday. After retirement, uncle moved in with us. I saw him every day. We were big baseball fans. If the Giants were in town for a day game during the summer, there was a good chance we'd be sitting in the bleachers. If not, we'd be listening on the radio. Together, we rooted and hoped for a World Series title. I used to watch him play solitaire. If he won three, four, five games in a row, he'd plan a quick trip to Reno to cash in on his winning streak. He used to tell me that once I was old enough to drive, he'd buy me a suit and together we'd go to Reno, just me and him. He always had hope. He hoped to see his mother in the Philippines. In 1957, he won second place in the Irish sweepstakes. Though his take of the purse was significant, that good fortune did not seem to change him. He shared his winning with the family. He was instrumental in helping us buy a new home. He sponsored nieces and nephews to immigrate, and most importantly to him, he was able to visit his mother in the Philippines, whom he hadn't seen in over 35 years. An article in the San Francisco Examiner dated 
March 30, 1957, quotes him as saying, I can't talk. I'm too excited. My mother is 84. She's been writing saying she wants me to come home to see her before she dies. Now I can go. Happy, you bet. My uncle was buried with Katrina. His name quietly added to their simple tombstone. His legacy, a grateful and generous heart, the backbone of our clan. Thank you. Oh, great, great story, Julian. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You know, and I know Uncle Vic. He did, clearly he did not cut my hair, but <laughs> I remember Uncle Vic like it was yes. And I remember that high chair, that stool. Right. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. And thank you for sharing the really the Filipino story. It's it's something that uh, I do and I, I hope to hear more from you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Neil. Uh, our next storyteller is uh, she's also a she's a veteran storyteller from she tells a story about her time in Florida and what she did. When she got really mad one day, here is Ginger Parnas. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, what am I doing? I'm inside a gutted out airplane over Homestead, Florida. I'm 28 years old and flouting death. What am I skydiving? Skydiving? How did this ever come about? It all started yesterday when I was about to leave work with Kevin, my boyfriend, and I said, hey, what are we going to do this weekend? Oh, well, uh, I have other plans. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? Melissa's coming to visit. I thought you two were done. Well, I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear. I'm going home. Have a good time. I go to my car. I'm practically crying. I start driving home. I feel like, am I going to kill myself over this guy? No way. I got to do something. I'm really, really upset. I get to a traffic light and I see a bumper sticker. Call 800 S K Y D I V E. Skydive. I've always wanted a skydive. I, I'm going to give it a try. I go home with my touch tone phone. 800 S K Y D. Hi, hi. Um, my name's Ginger and I'm interested in uh, your skydiving. When's the next class? How much does it cost? Well, you're in luck, lady, because tomorrow we're having a class. And uh, why don't you give me your name information? I'll sign you up. What, what, what does it entail? Well, you get about two or three hours of really good training. We teach you about the harnesses, about the uh, parachutes. You get to you're going to dive tandem with an instructor. Why don't you come on down? I sign up. I'm going to call some friends. I'm sure somebody wants to come. Well, phone call after phone call. What are you, crazy, Ginger? I decide to go alone. I get up the next morning. It's really quiet. And I drive an hour and a half down to Homestead, Florida. I'm in Miami. It's about an hour and a half. I'm a little late for the class. I kind of sneak in. Hey there. Welcome to the class. What's your name? Uh, my name's Ginger. Hi, I'm God. Pardon me? Hi, welcome. I'm your instructor. I'm God. I sit down. Hey, what's the deal with this, this man? The instructor. He said his name's God. 
oh, he's just from the panhandle. He's got really thick Southern accent. His name is Guy, but it sounds like God when he says it. Oh, okay. So we go through all the instructions and everything. And I'm very, very careful to listen because I know this is a matter of life and death or at least life and injury. And the most important thing I remember is that when I land, land with my feet bent, knees bent and stand up, I get teamed up with Guy. He's going to be my instructor that I fly tandem with or I dive tandem with. We go out to this airplane. Now we're back to right now. Oh, what am I doing in this airplane? I'd rather jump out of it than stay in it. Guy says, it's our turn. Come on. And we step out onto this strut that's attached to the wings. He tells me what to do. One hand, one foot. One hand, one foot. One hand, one foot. Finally, I'm out there and he says, let go. Wow. I've never, ever felt an experience like the free fall. It was better than any sex I ever had with Kevin. And then he says, open your chute. And we go floating down. I'm looking at South Florida. I am so glad I had this experience. I don't know how long we do this, but soon it's time. The ground is coming up. Bend your knees, bend your knees, bend your knees. Bend my knees. Glance. Stand up. Woo! I did it. I feel great. When I go into work on Monday, I go up to Kevin and I say, how was how was your weekend, Kevin? Yeah, well, we just hang out. It was yeah, it was a little boring, I guess. How about you? Well, uh, I went skydiving with God. All right, Ginger, thank you, thank you for that religious experience. <laughs> Ginger Parnas, she'll skydive with you if you want. Just give her an email. Uh, thank you, Ginger. And we must go on because time is, uh, yeah, we, we, well, our next storyteller is a member of the Asian American Storytellers in Unity. A friend of mine, I got to know her through that. She tells a, a unique story from the unique cultures that have defined her life. Here is Eleanor Clement Glass. It was my very first day of high school in Leavenworth, Kansas. Leavenworth, Kansas. My father, who was an army officer, was sent there, not to go to the penitentiary, but to attend a leadership training course there before his assignment, which was going to be in San Francisco at the Presidio. Well. They didn't have a high school on the base, so I was going to the public high school there. Now, on my very first day, my mom, who is Filipina, dropped me off. And as I walked down the halls with those gray lockers on either side, all I could see was a sea of black and white faces. It was really different from the middle school that I had just graduated from, which was International School Bangkok in Thailand. I almost bumped into a group of big white boys with their athletic jackets. They were blocking my way. And one of them looked at me. Are you Vietnamese? Well, I looked at him, I was just about to say, no, I'm black and Filipino, but they brushed by me, almost knocking over my book bag that was on my shoulder. Vietnamese, I don't look Vietnamese. Where did he get that? You know, it was 1964 and Vietnam was all over the place. I guess that was his frame of reference for anyone who didn't look like black or white in his world. 
Well, I was really hoping I would make some friends. I even tried out for cheerleader and this play through the drama club, not because I thought I would win or get a part. I just wanted to meet some people. We had a short time there. And of course I didn't win, I didn't get a part, but I did meet Sandy and Anne. They were white and we were in a class together. And then after a few weeks, they asked me to have lunch with them. I was so excited to have someone to eat lunch with, not have to eat by myself. We got to be friends. And then came the big Christmas dance. I was so excited. My mom got me this beautiful red dress, matching shoes. And I met Sandy and Anne at the dance. We climbed up the bleachers and sat midway. And we were watching, we were watching all the white couples dancing over here. And, and there was a big circle of all the black kids and they were dancing on the other side of the gym, way in the corner. Oh, I wished I would be asked to dance, but I didn't really know any boys. Well, soon two black boys were coming up to me. They were walking along the wooden bleachers and they were coming towards our group. And they, one of them said to me, uh, wanna dance? I said, yes, I would love to. And just as I went to stand up, they looked at each other. Oh, they were surprised and they backed away. I, I didn't know what had happened, but I saw them drop down the bleachers, walk across the gym over to the circle of black kids. All the boys swarmed them and they started talking animatedly, pointing up at the bleachers and all the little faces of those boys turned up to look at me. And then a miracle happened. A black boy left the group, came up the bleachers and over to me, he asked me to dance. I of course said yes. And he took my hand and helped me walk down the bleachers. That was so fun. I went back to the bleachers and another boy came and asked me to dance. And then another, it got to where I just stayed in the circle and I was dancing. I was giddy with delight. Well, I danced until the intermission. And then I was going over, gonna turn and walk toward the bleachers toward, to find my friend, Sandy and Anne. But I realized they were coming right at me, unsmiling. Susie grabbed my arm tight. She said, come with me right now. And Anne flanked my other side. When we got to the girls' bathroom, Susie pulled me and Anne pushed me inside. And then Susie swirled on me and she looked at me and she said, why the hell were you dancing with those niggers? I was stunned. I was furious. I stared right back at her and I said, because I am a nigger. Her head flew back like I had punched her in the face. Her pale pink cheek started getting blotchy red and the color went into her roots of her pixie blonde curls and her eyes wide. She came close to my face, so close. And then she screamed at me and the spittle sprayed from her mouth on me. You are not, you are not. And then she looked over at Anne for confirmation and Anne shook her head and said, she can't be, she, this can't be. I just looked at them and I pushed them to the side and I grabbed the door of the bathroom. I stomped out, I took a breath. And then I walked right over to the big circle of black kids and I danced the rest of the night until my dad picked me up. Now the next morning, my family piled into the family car and we took off for California. California, here we come. 
Now, I didn't feel completely relieved until we actually got to San Francisco. And then I thought to myself, I knew exactly what Dorothy felt because I knew I was not in Kansas anymore. Thank you. Oh, great story, Eleanor. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, I know you've been living with that story. I hope the class, well, clearly the class helped a little bit to take it out, but I hope it helped in your telling. I just want to know, didn't you dance with any Filipino boys? No Filipinos <laughs> in Kansas. Nope. Then. <laughs> if I were there, if I, I would have asked you to dance. Thanks, Emil. <laughs> Eleanor, thank you for sharing that story. And as you can see, ladies and gentlemen who are here for our international public performance with Mel in the Netherlands, uh, this is an outcome of our Enlighten the Page class. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's about noon. Really, thank you all. And thank you for all the enlightened and talented storytellers who took the class and to participate in this. It was a joy to be your instructor and a joy to be part of Stage Bridge this semester. So